This video will show you a 10-step pre-flight checklist before you install a cast iron cylinder head on the Model A Ford four-cylinder flathead engine. This is my method. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I've tried to put together the best information I have from multiple professional sources into a reliable procedure that anyone can do. In this video, we'll cover topics like checking your piston to head clearance, checking for flatness, and what you can learn from witness marks. And here's a quick look at the 10 steps we'll be going through. I've added chapter markers on this video, so you can use the progress bar or the description to skip ahead to the step you need to review. The first decision you'll have to make is which type of head you want to use. There are a number of cylinder heads currently being sold new, as well as vintage heads available in the swap meet market. There are heads that closely resemble the stock head, and heads that don't. Heads are made either of cast iron or aluminum. The method used in this video will work for any cast iron head. Although this method will work for an original stock cylinder head, I recommend you spend the money to get a high compression head. Installing a high compression cylinder head is one of the three most effective ways to improve the horsepower and torque output of the Model A engine. The second way is to install a downdraft manifold and carburetor, such as a Winfield or Weber or Stromberg carb. The third way is to replace the stock camshaft with a performance cam, such as the Stipe IB330. Also, you can't put a head on without a head gasket, so make sure you get one. The dominant maker of head gaskets for the Model A engine is Best Gasket. They offer two designs, the 509C and the 509G. I'm using a 509G graphite gasket from Best Gasket, uh, but you should consult the manufacturer of your cylinder head and use the gasket that they recommend. If you're using a vintage head, or one that's been used before, you should have it bead blasted and resurfaced by a machine shop to make sure it's completely clean and perfectly flat. If you're using a new cast iron head, it'll arrive from the vendor as bare metal. Either way, you'll need to paint it, or it'll start to rust. I'm not going to cover the paint process here in detail, but if you've never painted before, a couple of pointers. Mask off the machine surfaces before you start to paint. A ball-peen hammer works great to help you cut the mask just right. Ta-da! Use engine primer and engine enamel that's rated for above 400 degrees. You can use either Ford Green engine enamel or another color of your choice. Allow the enamel to cure for a full week before you install the head. Don't rush it or you'll damage the paint. I'm not going to cover removal of the old head and gasket. Pulling an old head can be really tricky. And that's not what this video is about. I'm just going to assume that you successfully removed the old head and the gasket. I'm also going to assume that you've removed the old studs and that you didn't break any of them or strip the threads and that you either clean them up or purchase new studs. Remove all the varnish and deposits and gasket material and all the other crud from the block. You should get down to shiny bare metal across the entire block surface and the piston heads. Now there's a lot of YouTube videos out there on how to clean cast iron blocks, so I'm not gonna cover it here. But a few pointers, use nylon discs or wheels to remove any surface rust or paint overspray or other crud from any surfaces, especially where surfaces where gaskets will be applied. Never use a wire wheel or a non-woven abrasive that could scratch, scratch the cast iron surface. Go slowly and carefully. Finish off with a solvent like brake cleaner applied to a lint-free rag. There are 14 stud holes, blind holes that are threaded and tapped into the Model A engine block. And the first thing that you need to do is make sure that they're clean. So you can click on the upper right corner of your video to see my video where I talk about how to clean these out. Make sure these are 100% clean uh, before you move on to the next step. Remove any sludge or rust or debris in all 14 stud holes. Note the position of any holes that have evident rust 
because that can indicate a coolant leak. Now, torquing down a cylinder head nut puts more than 8,000 pounds of force on the threads in the block. Now, are you sure that the threads in your block are in good shape? If you've got any helicoils in place, if any of the studs got broken when you pulled the head out, when you took the head off, you can test your block to make sure that the threads will hold when you put the new head on. You can see I'm setting up my test right now. So click the link in the top right corner to see my how-to video for how to test your engine block threads. Whether or not you test the threads, don't proceed until you feel confident that all 14 of your stud holes are solid. You know, keep in mind, you got 14 stud holes, which may seem like a lot, but uh, when Ford went to the V8, they, they went to 21 stud holes um, per uh, four-cylinder uh, group, which, you know, that's 50% more stud holes uh, with not a lot more compression. So um, they obviously felt like 14 was maybe not quite enough. So if we're working with just the 14, we really need to be sure that all of them are solid, that they're all going to hold at least 8,000 pounds or more uh, because of the the combustion pressure that's going to be coming up on them. There's the risk of detonation. You really want to be sure these are solid. So uh, check out that video. Or make sure that you feel ready to continue. Now, a witness mark is any kind of scratch or a dent or other kind of mark that was put there by some previous mechanic, whether intentionally or otherwise. Um, Witness marks and damage can give you a lot of information about the life history of your engine block. Uh, it's important when, when you're looking for witness marks and damage, and kind of assessing them, it's important to see where the head gasket is going to go, uh, where it's going to seal against the block, because damage that's under a ceiling area, and you don't have to be exactly accurate here, but damage that's under a ceiling area, it's just going to be different than damage. Uh, or witness marks that are not. What you're looking for here is cracks in the block surface, cracks in the valves, scoring or pitting in the cylinder bore, ridges in the cylinder bore, pitting or heavy wear on the valve face or the seat. If you notice any of those, you should probably stop and consult an export before continuing. So let's take a tour of this engine. Uh, I'm going to try to point out witness marks and damage that, that I'm aware of, try to speculate a little bit about what they mean. Your engine's going to be different, uh, and I'm sure there are marks and damage here that a more experienced mechanic would know what they are, and I just don't know what they are, and that's part of how you grow uh, in this hobby. But starting right here, uh, you should be able to see there's a set of little divots right here, and they're right around this stud. Now, if one of the things about divots that you care about is, is this under a ceiling area or is it in the combustion chamber? So you can see right here, that's definitely going to be under where the gasket is sealing and pretty close to the edge. So I care about these because these might contribute to any some kind of leaking. Now I think these divots may be from somebody who was trying to get uh, a gasket off, a head gasket off, and they might have been coming in here with a screwdriver or something, trying to pry it off and making these little divots. Um, another thing that you can see here is these pistons are marked. So this is pistons marked 100, means it's bored 100 over. And that's something that if you buy a car, you may not know till you actually get into the engine and check it out, whether you've got uh, pistons that are bored over. Uh, 100 is getting close to getting close to your limit. 125 is about the limit. That's the point at which you would, if you had to go any farther, you'd want to sleeve it back to standard. But 100's, 100's okay. This piston has this mark right here, which I'm not sure what it means. It could mean um, could mean that this is the number one piston. You know, this person's just trying to indicate uh, that this one is going to go at the number one. I'm not sure exactly what it means. Could be some kind of orientation. So moving on from there, we've got these punch marks. These are from this valve seat insert being redone. So in the past, sometime in the past, this valve seat, valve seat insert came out and it was re, it was replaced and the guy who uh, replaced it put in these little uh, peen, you peen this um, uh, engine block. And the reason that this is done, this is, eh, there's, there are guys who do not think this 
really does anything, but the idea is that it pushes the cast iron into the insert. It sort of pushes it out to hold that insert in place. Um, that's just part of the way some guys do these. You're also going to want to make sure you look at the cylinder bore, right? Make sure it's smooth. Feel it with your fingernail. Feel if there's any ridges or any scoring. You're going to want to look under the valve seats. Just crank the engine around and get under get these valves up and look at the valve face, look at the valve seat. You're looking for pitting. One thing that is noticeable here, you can see all this pitting on the face right around the, this is the exhaust valve. And over here as well, there's pitting right around the exhaust valve. That's very common for exhaust uh, valves just because of the hot gases. And again, what we care about is, is this under a sealing surface? So you can see here, this, all this punching, all this pitting, this is not under a ceiling surface. This is inside the combustion chamber. So uh, we, we don't really care about it. Um, that's okay. Another thing that's really important here, if you look, there are there is a crack right here and right here. So this crack goes from this uh, coolant passage to the stud hole, then to this coolant passage. Um, cracks can be a big problem. This one's probably okay. This one probably results from somebody in the past over torquing this stud and putting this little hairline crack here. Um, but since it's just going from water jacket to water jacket and it's not going into the cylinder or into the valve, uh, this is this is probably okay. Nevertheless, I'm probably going to uh, use some RTV silicone sealant on this stud just to make sure that there's no migration of coolant into this stud hole. That's the kind of thing that you want to look at. Um, uh, you want to look at you know this kind of wear pattern right here on this on this water passage whoop, on this coolant passage you do want to check these because if that is going too far under where the um, gasket's going to seal between <clears throat> the gasket's trying to seal between this coolant passage and the outside right here so if this is if this is starting to wear away then that's a problem you don't want this to be too narrow or the whoops or the coolant's gonna gonna get out there so that could be something that you'd want to pay attention to and maybe uh, use some fluid weld here or something else uh, that's gonna try to hold that in for you so right here they see you can um, see this rough patch right here and actually if if you were to go over this uh, with a straight edge and feeler gauges you would feel that it's kind of it's scooped out a little bit right there so right above here there's a there's a casting void in the head right above this spot um, and so what that means is the the gasket goes over here and there's no metal pressing the gasket down so little gaps develop under here and little hot gases and uh, little things kind of make their way under here and then they they corrode this away so you're going to see this a lot um, on on older heads that haven't been i'm sorry or older blocks that haven't been decked um, and it's the kind of thing where it's not doing anybody any harm, um, but you definitely want to be aware of it as it, you know, as it can grow toward this stud bore or as it can grow toward this cylinder bore. You definitely want to keep an eye on it. You can see here too, see these kind of uh, transverse, these, these hashes or scratches. Um, I'm not sure what these are from. I don't think they're doing any harm, um, but they do... They are coming pretty close. They're in that little ceiling area. So I don't know, I might, I might put some fluid weld on these just in case. It's the kind of decisions you have to make. That's everything that I know. Now, what's, of course what's gonna happen is I could come back to this in three or four years, five years, 10 years, and knowing what I know then, I'll see a lot more. I'm sure there's somebody watching this video who's like, why aren't you talking about this thing? Uh, and that's just because I'm, that's, that's the limits of my experience. I don't know it yet. But, uh, you know, take a close look at your engine block. Get somebody who's more experienced to come take a closer look at it with you. You know, take take pictures. <laughs> Make sure your pictures are in focus. You know, post it to a forum. Say, do you, do you guys see anything? Both the block and the head should be flat. The more perfectly flat they are, the better the gasket seal. Now... People disagree about how tight a tolerance is required.
this is the section that's going to get the most pushback probably from the guys on the internet forums. These are just the standards that I use. Um, I recommend two thousandths tolerance for the head. For the block, I'm using four thousandths or less. Remember, the combined distortion at any one point is, is actually the key. Really, you should make up your own mind based on your research, your particular situation, the amount of tolerance that you think is okay. Um, but you can use this procedure no matter what the actual numbers are that you decide on. To measure flatness, you're going to need feeler gauges and a straight edge. So for feeler gauges, uh, you can buy these lots of places. Make sure that it has a lot of options at the low end. So you can see this one has 0 0.0015, 0 0.002, 0 0.004, 3. So um, some some of them don't have a lot of options down low, which is where you're going to need it for measuring flatness. So make sure you get one that has a lot of options down at the low end. You're also going to need a precision straight edge. Now, this is not a ruler. Uh, you can't you can't substitute anything for a precision straight edge that's not a precision straight edge. Uh, this should be ground to a tolerance of plus or minus 1,000 across a length, 1,000th across a length of 24 inches. Um, these cost about 40, 50, uh, and up. Um, so that might make it the second most expensive part that you need for this project other than the head itself. Um, but to measure flatness, you really can't do it without a precision straight edge. So take your straight edge and put it top of the head. Now you're going to take your feeler gauge and try to slide it under at various points. You can see it went under right on the edge there. Not really here. Nope. 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 and then right under on the edge. So because it, it only went under here on this edge and there on that edge, on the very, very edge, that's something I'm not super concerned about. What you're looking for is big gaps right here in the middle or a gap that gets wider as you go across the length of the head. But uh, this one seems to pass. And then after this, you can check your block. All right, so now you're going to do the same thing on the block. Now notice that because of the various sting things sticking out of the block, you may not be able to hit exactly the same positions as on the head. Uh, I only showed you one position on the head, but you should really check diagonal and across and all the different positions to try to build up a map of the distortions. Because even though you've got maybe a standard of 0 0.002 on the head and 0 0.004 on the block. The thing you really care about is the combined distortion at any point. So you want to map the one to the other and make sure there's no point where, you know, the, the block is low and the head is also low, so they're drawing away from each other and creating a big gap that the gasket's going to have to fill. My personal rule of thumb is, 0.005 thousandths combined distortion at any one point. If it's if it's more than that, then the gasket's going to have a hard time sealing that, even if you increase your torque. So uh, again, you're you're going to want to just put your straight edge on like that. Make sure you're not you know make sure you're not resting on the throttle assembly or anything. Make sure you're not resting on any valves or any or may, and make sure your pistons are all down in the block um, and then again you're just going to go through and check everything and make sure that uh, there's no area where the distortion is too great so you're going to measure you know maybe here and then here measure across I can't measure exactly the same point because I got my distributor shaft sticking up but you just want to try to build up a map of where your low points are um, you know, assuming you haven't had both of these recently resurfaced, you're definitely going to have some kind of low points, and you've got to make a decision as to uh, whether you feel like the to the tolerance is okay, or whether you need to stop and get one of one or both the head or the block resurfaced. Okay, there are four quarter-inch castings that go through to the water jacket. You want to use a flashlight and check to make sure 
each of them actually does go through into the water jacket. Sometimes on a brand new head, these don't get um, drilled through all the way. They're just blind. So you just want to look and make sure, can I see through the other side? Is there light that's coming out here where I can see it? And with this one, you just need to make sure you can see through to the other side. If any of these turn out to actually be blind, uh, send the head back or, or get, get somebody to fix it. Now here on the block, you've got more quarter inch castings for coolant passages. Uh, again, here you want to verify that none of them are blocked, but in, in contrast to on the head where they might be blocked because of a bad casting, here they're, if they're blocked, they're probably blocked because of um, rust or scale that have built up. And one way that you can check for that is, so these are quarter inch, and so you can take a quarter inch roll pin punch and just see, just see if you can get down in there. This one I can get down a little bit, a little bit, all the way. So you can see here, this one's open. These, nah, maybe, there could be something in there. Could be a part of the, part of the block that's blocking me. But you can then go from, from a quarter, go down one size. Yeah, now I got in pretty easily. So this one, you know, if, the, if it's blocked, it's not, block that bad. Some of these, your engines, you may find this is blocked entirely. Um, and once you've checked the castings, you can also look at just these larger passages to just try to get a sense of how bad your rust and scale problem are. Unless you're doing a freshly rebuilt engine, you're probably going to have some uh, you know, rust or scale problem. And what you're trying to do here is not fix it. There's nothing you can do about it at this point. You're just trying to get a sense of how bad it is so that when you get the block back together, get the engine back together, you can run Thermocure or another kind of radiator flush treatment. And based on the the ha -ha scale of your problem, uh, you'll know what severity you should expect, how many times you need to run it. Um, this is just kind of giving yourself a little advance warning about how bad your scale problem is in your cooling system. The one of the most important checks to make when you're, select, when you're switching to a new cylinder head is to confirm that you've got sufficient piston to head clearance. Now on a typical Model A flathead engine, when a piston reaches top dead center, it's actually sticking up above the top of the block by a small amount. And this protrusion is called pop-up. In a stock engine that hasn't, hasn't been decked, hasn't been milled flat, a stock engine with stock pistons, the pop-up's going to measure about 30 thousandths. However, if you've got aftermarket pistons, if your block's been milled several times in the past, you know, you're taking off a little bit every time, uh, that pop-up can become quite large. I've seen guys report a pop-up of 85 thousandths. That's, that's quite a lot. You probably won't have that much, but it can get quite large. If the piston at top dead center extends too far above the block, uh, it, you can actually hit the head with the piston. Um, and obviously uh, that, that would be bad. Um, so this is why when you're doing a new head or you're making any changes here, you should calculate your piston to head clearance to confirm that there's sufficient clearance uh, to proceed with the installation the way you're doing it. So let's talk about that. All right, to calculate piston to head clearance, you're gonna need three values, the fly cut depth on the head, the gasket thickness, the head gasket thickness, and the piston pop up. So what these all are, you can see I got a diagram here Here's your piston, and here's your block. The piston is going to come slightly above the block. The distance that the piston is above the block, that distance is your pop-up. And then up here, you can imagine you've got your cylinder head, and underneath it, your gasket. And there's on most cylinder heads, there's going to be a cutout uh, where the piston's going to go. And that cutout, that depth is called, that's called the fly cut. So you need the depth of that cutout, and then you need the width of your gasket. Now, to calculate the gasket thickness, you can't actually calculate it because that number is the thickness of the gasket after it's been installed and compressed during the break-in process. So you can't just go and, and have it out of the car and say, well, how thick is this? 
and take that for your number. What you have to do is get that information from the gasket manufacturer. They'll be able to tell you that value. So for mine, I've got the 509G graphite gasket. For mine, that value is 0.054, plus or minus two thousandths. So that's what Best Gasket said. Calculate your fly cut, calculate your pop-up, take your gasket, and then you're going to make this calculation. The fly cut plus the gasket minus the pop-up. That number equals your clearance. Uh, it's also called the quench, or you'll sometimes see it called the squish. Um, this is the air gap, this tiny little gap right here between the piston and the head. And when the, uh, when the spark plug ignites, then the flame front has to travel through that when the fuel is ignited. The minimum squish distance permissible is 0.040, so 40 thousandths. Um, but if the number that you get is anything close to that, 50 thousandths, you know you should you should stop and consult an expert just to make sure because that is that's really low for a for a non-racing model A. Like you, if you're in this zone, then you should you should be doing a lot of machining and very special. Um, very special arrangements. So if you're anything close to this, be careful. Um, because what could happen is at that distance, you know, if you're connecting rod stretch, um, then the, the piston could impact the head when you're under load. Um, however, if your squish distance is substantially greater than these minimums, you're good to go. So what I recommend that you do, I'm going to show you how to calculate these, but you should just keep track. Make, made a little diagram here, pistons one, two, three, and four, and I'm going to write down the fly cut depth for each on the head and the pop up for each on the block. So let's go, I'll show you how to calculate that, and then we'll come back and see what we got. Tools. First, you're going to need a dial indicator, and you're also going to need this. So this is called a deck bridge. This costs about 30 bucks. The deck bridge holds the dial indicator on top of the deck, and then you tighten it down so that the dial indicator doesn't go anywhere. And this is going to allow you to properly zero the dial indicator to the deck of the block and the head. Now a lot of dial indicators come with a magnetic base that has a, an arm that you set. Don't try to do it that way. Get the deck bridge. If you do it with the arm, then as what, what happens is you'll have to push on the arm to get it to move from the deck to the cylinder and as you push it you will wiggle it and it'll you'll lose your accuracy so don't do it go ahead spend the money get the deck bridge uh, it's really the only way to do it properly to measure the fly cut depth the first thing that you need to do is to zero the dial indicator so let's assume for the moment that I'm at my natural zero here you want to put the deck bridge here where it's supported by the deck and the dial indicator pointer is right there on the deck. So you can see it's at this kind of arbitrary value and what I'm going to do is rotate the face of my dial indicator so that this is at zero and then lock it down. And, and one thing you can do is you can you can kind of check around various points on the deck just to verify that your deck is indeed uh, flat. You should get zero all these different points where you're trying it. So once you've zeroed it, as I slide down, see how it goes around? That means it's going, even though it's reading 40, it is actually going around 60, because you're counting counterclockwise. So this is indicating 60 roughly, or f 59 thousandths of an inch fly cut depth. So what I'm gonna do is put my little indicator right here to remind me of where I where I was right there. And if you are really meticulous about it, you can try to separate these to give yourself a range, the range that you're seeing. So what you're going to do now is just move this around, try a number of different positions, and then move on to the next one. Now in my case, I'm getting 60 again, 60 again. You just keep doing this, you test your next one. If you were getting different values, that would be something you'd be concerned about, and you would definitely want to write down what the different values were that you were getting. 
um, because you would you'll need to match those up to the pistons and and also having different values is not necessarily good because your combustion chambers will be a different size if you can see I've got 60 again and then here 60 again so once you've established to your satisfaction what the fly cut depth is then you go write that down and then you can move to measuring the pop-up on the block so to calculate piston pop-up you're going to need to be able to crank the engine over and the more precision you have in your cranking the better um, you're going to be using a deck deck bridge and the dial indicator but before we get to that uh, it's it's really important where you measure on the piston because of a thing called piston rock so these pistons are mounted to the connecting rods by wrist pins which go this way uh, what that means is that as the piston goes up and down in the cylinder board, there's a little bit of rocking back and forth along that axis. And since we're measuring in thousandths of an inch, that rocking is kind of important and you want to null it out the best you can. So these wrist pins all go longitudinally. And when we're measuring, when you're measuring with your uh, dial indicator, you want to make sure that you're hitting your measurements along these along you know kind of right in this area where the wrist pin is not out here if you measure it out here you will get bad numbers or at least you'll get different numbers i mean in theory you can measure here and then here and then average them if there was something preventing you from but you should just measure where the wrist pin is so the first thing you're going to do with your get your deck bridge in here and you're going to put you're going to put your dial indicator down on the deck to give you a zero point so now that i've got my zero going to adjust my zero point right about there and I'll, I'll clamp that down and now so note I've got a zero here and my small dial I don't know what you call that is um, between two and three and that's just important when you're moving the piston over such a wide area so now I've zeroed to my deck and now I'm going to position this over where the wrist pin is you got to improvise a little to find a good place where, you know, keep in mind, you don't want your, your deck bridge supports over the piston area. So that's kind of a good, actually, maybe I can, if I can move it back. Yeah, that's good right there. That's perfect. Okay, so now this piston is not quite at top dead center. It's close. But what I'm going to do... I position that there, then I'm going to crank this over. So here comes the piston up. You'll see the dial indicator moves, and we're looking for where the dial indicator tops out. Right, whoop, go back. Some of you probably won't be able to go back like I can. So just look for that needle to slow and, and stop and try to get it as close as you can. Okay. So now, so there's my zero, and I've come up to, this looks like about 16 thousandths. So this one protrudes above, the, the pop-up for this piston is 16 thousandths. And if you want to, you can check it on the other side, you know, verify your reading. The main thing I would say is do this on each piston, because, you know, these are 90-year-old engines, who knows how these how these crankshafts have been set up, what these have been true to in the past. Uh, you definitely want to check each piston and get each piston's measurement because they definitely could be off from each other. So measure them all and then come back to your piece of paper and write down which measurements you got. And then you can move on to checking the fly cut depth and then you can get your do your calculations. So let's go and do that. So let's see what we've got. So I've measured the fly cut depth on my head, and this was a new head, and so it wasn't surprising that all of the fly cut depths were exactly the same, 60 thousandths. And then I measured the pop-up on my pistons, and those came in very different. This one in particular, number one, you can see very different from the others. Uh, I don't think it'll make a huge difference as far as whether the engine works or not, uh, but obviously the next time there's a rebuild that is definitely something that I would want to pay attention to the other thing that you can see here is these go down and um, when you see that when you see this slowly 
um, decreasing or increasing distance. Um, one thing that that can mean is that at some point in the past, the uh, the block, the 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 plane along which the block is decked, and the uh, the plane of the crankshaft may have gotten off from each other. In other words, the the crankshaft is you know higher here and then or sorry higher here and then it's going very slightly down as you go toward the front of the car um, and that can mean that either the deck the, the block was decked not quite in alignment with the datum of the crankshaft or it could mean that there was a the when the crankshaft was reground the um, you know the bearings for the connecting rods are not quite the same it's definitely something that I would want to look at the next time I do a rebuild but in terms of the piston to head clearance I'm pretty safe so you can see you know keep in mind between each of these is a 0.054 gasket so my combined available depth here is roughly 0.114 so the on all of these my combined my available depth is 0.114 and the pop-up is going to subtract from that so 0.114 minus 0.024 is going to be 0.09, right, and here it's going to be 0 0.093, 0 0.096, um, and then 0 0.109, I think, doing this math on the fly. Anyway, plenty of room, right, so roughly 0 0.100 available. Um, so. Roughly is my available piston to head clearance with a little bit of uh, diff with a little bit of difference depending on the piston. So that is good. So this this block and head are not going to have a problem. But for example, I have seen I've seen heads where the where the fly cut depth is zero. There's no fly cut at all. So if there is no fly cut at all and my gasket was 0.054, then if I've got this amount of pop up 0.024. You can see 5.4 minus 2.4 is 0 0.03. That puts me under the minimum because my fly cut depth is zero. So if I had, you know, if somebody had sold me a head that had no fly cut and I did this math, then I should be worried. I am under the minimum quench. I'm going to have to go to what I, what I should do if that happens or what you should do if that happens is you should go to a machine shop and have them add a fly cut for you that is going to bring you up to at least the minimum and I would say a little bit over um, that quench so that you're otherwise you're going to have your pistons hitting the heads so definitely that's that's why this is so important to make this calculation test fit the distributor body to the distributor bore and the index hole the distributor should slide cleanly down in the bore. And the index pin should fit completely into the hole. If the body or the pin won't go in or they bind in any way, then you need to sand down either the distributor or the bore or the or the index pin hole before you continue. Before you move on to installing your cylinder head, make sure you put together all the parts and tools you're going to need. So here's what I recommend you have on hand at a minimum. Of course, you're going to need your head studs and your nuts. You're going to need a new water outlet and water pump gaskets. For the water outlet, you definitely want to use copper. Um, there's, another, there's another approach where you just use RTV silicone, but uh, the, the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to do the paper gasket. Of the three approaches, that's the one you don't want. Um, going to need a little motor oil and a little oiler. Going to need some anti-seize and some RTV silicone gasket maker. Going to need some non-hardening gasket sealer. Uh, you'll probably need some copper spray gasket in most cases. Going to need a torque wrench with an 11 16 inch socket. And then um, if your engine block looked like mine did with a lot of battle damage, then I recommend you might consider picking up a bottle of Seal Lock Fluid Weld. It's optional. 
it's expensive, uh, but this is a product that a lot of machine shops use, and it withstands very high temperatures, so you can use it to help seal between little cracks or little divots in the block and your head gasket. So this is a this can be a good option if you if you don't want to go to the time and expense of having your block resurfaced. You may be able to get away uh, using this, and I'll I'll show you in in my cylinder head install video exactly how I use this. Here's a quick recap of the steps we went through to pre-flight our cylinder head install. Admit it, you did not think this was going to be that much work, did you? I sure didn't when I started planning this video. I'm going to have a follow-up video on the actual head installation. I'll show you how I use fluid weld, stuff about stealing the gasket, how I prep the head studs. I'm going to have a section on whether or not you need to back your studs out one turn. People do that a lot. Uh, but it might be a couple of months before I can post that. Meanwhile, if you're an expert Model A mechanic, please post a video yourself. Add to the library of YouTube. Doesn't matter what it is. Simple maintenance tasks, anything. We need more good Model A instructional videos out there. Please share your knowledge with the world. And thanks very much to everybody who helped me put this video together.